I'll refer to the, uh, when we mention the Trinity, we refer to it as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is one of their arguments, that this is, this is the authority structure. That's why we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but if you actually read through, some of you will be. If you read through the scriptures, that actually, those, those, those titles for the three persons, the triune listing, okay, is actually reversed and mixed up throughout other parts of the scriptures. Sometimes, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Spirit is mentioned first, then the Lord, then God. Not in a short list, but they're but it's listed that way. And if and if listing, if how they're listed in Scripture, from left to right, or primarily mentioned, like the Father's mentioned first, and then somewhere in the verse you see, or the next verse you see the Son mentioned, or whatever. If that if that form of listing the members of the persons is because of authority, then we have a problem because they're listed in different orders throughout the rest of the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 mentions Jesus first, then God, then the Holy Spirit. Jude 20 through 21, if you want to look at it. Um, I wouldn't have time to go through every verse that I have for these points, but I have no problem looking at one or two just to establish what, what I'm talking about. So Jude, verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, or by your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. You see the listening? First the Holy Spirit, then God, which is God in the Old Testament and the New Testament is most often referred to as the Father, and then you have the Son mentioned last. So I don't think on their point that the order in which the members of the Trinity are listed necessarily indicates authority. I think the scriptures would actually bear out, you know, something something different. Now to the title aspect. I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. So not only are the titles of um, the, the, pre the, the, the eternal subordination is view argue that the Father is the Father and it's a title in, it's a title of the Father and if, he, if, if the Father is the Father and he's not the Son, and the Son is the Son and not the Father. And because one's called Father and the other's called Son, then of course one's going to be author authoritative and the other submissive. Um, now this, this concept might be a little bit new to you, so you know, hang on to your seats or whatever. But this passage is actually talking about the Son. This is caught, talking about Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. The Son is he called Eternal Father. Now why is that? Well, I think it's because, and I'll tell you, there are other scriptures where actually like the Lord is the Spirit. Those Jesus is now called the Spirit. I think it's because... Uh, these terms Father and Son are titles taken on by the members of the Trinity in order to communicate the functions that each person of the Trinity is taking on in the redemptive act. But I don't think these titles are necessarily eternal titles. Matter of fact, I think the proper term for who we normally refer to as the Son, if we want to find a scripture that helps us see who is the Son in eternity and not just in time, is in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. If we want to try to find a title for one of the members of the Trinity that doesn't have to do with this relationship that's going on in history, in creation, we find it actually in John 1 1. He is the Word. Now you would think, now maybe John's just trying to make a point. And I'm not going to say that these two positions are cut and dry. Honestly, when I was studying a lot of this stuff, I started leaning towards one. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. I started leaning towards another. Oh, that sounds pretty good. You know? And I got it caught up in this movement. No, I'm just kidding. With you, right? <laughs> but really, when you're studying this stuff, you've got scholars who, who are presenting very good cases on both sides, and there's some merit to them. If there wasn't merit to both sides at all, I think pretty much orthodoxy would have rejected one completely, like, let's say, Arianism, and they would have just kicked them out as a cult. So... So there's some very interesting things, but 
Um, you know, one could argue, well, John just wanted to use that, that term for one specific reason, to communicate some aspect of the second member, but he's not, he's not eliminating the Son as an eternal title. If you want to make that claim, that's fine, um, but where is that in Scripture? I'm not sure. I mean, we do have, uh, number one, that the Son is called the Eternal Father, and number two, in John 1, 1, we actually have a view of what his title is in eternity past, and I think that weighs on the side of the egalitarians. That in eternity past, really his title is the Word. Now, I don't think the Spirit has really changed his title at all. So we, we've also been given a pretty good title for the Spirit. That's where we're going. The title of the Father is actually an interesting one. It's, uh, it's been a little difficult for me to really think of one, because every time I think of, let's say, old, I'm, I'm looking besides God, but then we use God, that all three are God. Lord in the, in, the old, in the New Testament refers to Jesus almost every single time. In the Old Testament, we have Yahweh, we have, uh, we have the Lord of hosts, we have a ton of titles for God. Um, we have I Am, but then Jesus says that I am, I am the I Am. So, maybe, so the I Am isn't restricted specifically to what maybe we would just call for numbers' sake, not in primacy's sake, not in, not in one being more God than the other, but what we would normally refer to as the first person of, of the Godhead, which we usually say as Father, because we haven't really found a, another title specifically for it. I'm not really, I'm not, I would really, you know, welcome any input into that. I'm not really sure. God Most High? Um, maybe that's in reference only to the first person. I haven't resolved that yet. I don't really, I haven't, I don't have a concrete title for the, for one of the members of the Trinity, namely the one that we refer to as the Father, um, since since New Testament times. But we definitely, Spirit or Holy Spirit remains for the Spirit throughout the entire Scriptures. We don't see that changing at all. Uh, even at the moment of creation, when the Spirit was moving around and being involved in creation. But for the Son, we definitely have a different one, and that's the Word. And I think that's pretty definitive. So, since everything about God is shared equally and extensively by each person of the Trinity, temporal subordination seems to best describe the authority structure between the three members. It's, it's temporal. There's, there's, there's nothing that one person of the Trinity possesses that the other does not that maintains this unity and integrity of the Trinity, the three in one, um, but yet they can assume particular roles for particular reasons in which to carry out uh, redemption. The wisdom behind why one chose to take on one particular role versus another, I'm not really sure. The scripture doesn't give us a lot of reason. Uh, my, my, uh, uh, my theological guess is, from what I understand of the scriptures in their entirety, is it's in love. The one certainly was out of love, willing to uh, provide a redemptive plan, and one of the persons was certainly willing out of love to uh, go through suffering and sacrifice in order to accomplish that plan. That plan. So, um, and I'm getting close to my time here. No, that wasn't it. Okay. But, um, yeah, so, um, that's those, that's pretty much the two views. I hold I hold on the uh, uh, I hold on the side of the egalitarian view. Um, there are passages in the scripture. I'd encourage you to try to find them um, to where, like for example, let's just turn to First Peter. I'll give you one real quick, just so you can uh, be sure. There's one. First Peter chapter one. That what you really have is you you have a cooperative, co-equal yet yet distinct operation of the Trinity in the acts of God in creation. So like for example in, ch in verse 2 of chapter Peter verse 1 that um, those who are chosen were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit okay, uh, because of obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I kind of read a, a Greek translation of that verse. Um, not that this isn't a Greek translation, but it's a different translation. <laughs> <laughs> Modified Greek translation. Modified. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I think is what's happening is you have this cooperative, unified will. We see that there is a will of each person of the Trinity. But being that, that they are all omniscient, 
and all good, okay, so all the attributes that we ascribe of God, each person holds. Omniscient, omnipotent, okay, holy good, all these different things, though they have distinct wills, will always will the same thing. So they come to a, com a community, for lack of a better term, because com means with, and unity means one. So they come together in a unified will, a community of action, so each one is, is participating in action that as a whole accomplishes the will, and those things come together to accomplish the redemptive plan, and all three participate, and during that time, there is an authority submissive structure to it, um, but that is not something that's based in eternity. Pretty much, yeah, that's about it. So, um, without going to some other uh, fine details about certain things, and there's some other passages that are brought up, I don't think they're necessarily as strong. Um, that's it. If anybody wants to throw out some points on one side or the other, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes, sir. Uh, a comment. Uh, there's nothing wrong with looking like me, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, now, on a serious note, I know note, your wife just thinks so. I, I think I think I loosely ascribe to uh, the, um, I guess the temporal subor or I guess the eternal subordination, uh, indirectly because you know this is what they teach in schools, unfortunately. And but, however, I think that it naturally brings up questions that you can't answer, and then it's kind of given that, you know, God's ways are higher are higher than ours, which is a, a bad excuse, you know, for trying to understand something that's understandable. Right. But uh, it makes more sense. I like it. I, I thought you did a great job, by the way. Uh, but it makes more sense because in the, in the temporal subordination and the, their, their equality, it's not even really a subordination. So it's like, um, I don't know, it, it, for me it's more palatable, more uh, understandable to understand this very complex nature of God, three and one, when that is a temporal subordination. Because, I mean, you see it, because it has to be a temporal subordination, because how can God pour himself out, you know, in, into uh, the humanity of Christ? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, really, I really enjoy that. I don't know if I'm making sense, or, but it just it, it makes it, I, I guess, easier to understand something very difficult. Well, I'm glad I was able to make something somewhat easier to understand because when I presented this, sometimes I don't know, I know what I, you know, I know what I want to convey, and I'm not sure how well that's being conveyed to those that are listening. So I'm glad it's made, it's cleared up some things for you, and um, I, I, I think it makes, you know, more sense. Obviously, there are still questions that are unanswered. Um, some of them I don't think we can. We just, we'd have to be God to fully understand. But anyways, before I get, I'm going to kick this No. Uh, most schools, as, as Greg said, are, uh, teach sub, uh, eternal subordination, correct? Yes. And in fact, one of the great church creeds contains the uh, the cause for the split between the East and Western Church, the Philippe Clause. I can't remember which. Is that the Anathesian Creed or the Nicene Creed? But it says that the, the Spirit, the Nicene. The Nicene. Okay. It wasn't. I don't think it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. No, it's a longer <laughs> creed. Yeah. Anyway, it says that the uh, that the son proceeds from the father, right? And the and uh, the the question was whether the, the the Holy Spirit came from the son or the father. Anyway, that would be that whole creed would be thrown out then, right? Uh, yeah, I, if your view is correct, yes, it would be. Matter yeah, of fact, it would um, nullify that. Yeah. One of the theologians, uh, trying to be sensitive, but at the same time making a joke, <laughs> said. And, and I have a problem with this. If, if, if I mean, if, if eternal subordination is true, I gotta adjust my thinking, right? I adjust to the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one of the problems that um, eternal subordination has to explain is how does the Holy Spirit fit within this familial relationship? You see, you have the Father and the Son, and the, one of the guys asks, "Well, who's the Holy Spirit? The grandson?" Now, I'm not trying to be funny about it, but really. There's such an, they, they play such an intimate 
uh, uh, they, they argue such so intimate, you know, there's this such intimate love that's going on between the Father and the Son in this structure that's going on here. In my view, I mean, he's like a stepchild or something. I'm, you know, I'm not really sure where he stands. The red hair. The red hair. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure where the Holy Spirit stands in this tight family relationship. But in the egalitarian view, I think he stands in just as much prominence as the Son and the Father. Matter of fact, something that I, I was thinking about in my studies is if love is one of the essential ways in which the Trinity relates to itself, I want you to see something. Each one is extending, each one is extending, right? Perfect love to the other, okay? But what you find is that, and maybe these lines aren't going to really help anything, so let me just say it, is that each person is loved more, if you can quantify it to a certain extent, so I'm kind of you know, using some, some human ways of trying to think about this, but each person in the Trinity is loved more than they're loving, because they're receiving love from two of the persons mm -hmm. in the Trinity, but they're only one person extending love outwards. So the Trinity, and, it, it, and if you want to try to describe in some sense this family, when I said familiar, I meant familiar, I meant family, this family relationship of the persons, it's in love. It's in complete love. They're completely satisfied. Though, though each, each loving the other is an unselfish act, they're not loving themselves, they receive more love in some sense. Uh, not that you can go more beyond it perfect love. But in some sense they're receiving more love in that they're receiving it from two persons. They're receiving more love than they're loving, but they're loving as much as they can, right? Because, I mean, you can have no greater love than a love for God even in, within the Trinity. I mean, they love one another. And then that love gets expressed outwards. So not only is love unselfish within the Trinity, but then the Trinity decides to function in a communal way to redeem a lost humanity by sacrificing itself in order to bring a humanity that's out here inside into a communal relationship with the very Trinity itself. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions or, or comments? No? Yes, Phil. Uh, I just kind of wanted you to maybe speak a little bit to um, how you see, when you say sharing the uh, nature of God, uh, obviously I don't think you mean it as if you would a piece of pie, whereas somebody shares in the nature, they get one piece and the other gets another and stuff like Co that. Correct, you're absolutely right. So, so I, did you finish your question? No, but... Okay, go on. Uh, so, so I was just wondering, um, uh, so it's not a division, uh, and I, I wanted you to explain that a little bit more, and then if you could put it in the context of how that might look in your uh, eternal and temporal whether they're the same, whether you take, if you take each view, does it remain the same, or does it change, depending on the view? I don't think, they both agree on the orthodox view of the Trinity. The argument is over how the Trinity relates, how the persons of the Trinity relate to one another. Okay? They all fully, equally, simultaneously share the nature of God. Each person does. Um, so, so there's no, there's no problem in that regard. Now, something that happens in history, though, is one of the persons, though not changing in his divine nature, takes on, we would say like in addition, takes on a particular nature that the other two persons do not take on. That's namely that the Word takes on flesh <coughs> and becomes the God-man. I don't think that disturbs or changes anything concerning the divine nature of the second member and how this divine, the, divine, uh, the second person relates within the nature of the Trinity <coughs> itself. I don't think that changes anything. Um, it changed the relationship of how the second member of the Trinity began relating to the other two members of the Trinity. And that's the temporal view. That at that point, when the, when the Word became flesh and became Jesus Christ, he took on the form of a bond servant and became submissive to the will of the Father. And in sometimes even submissive to the will of the Holy Spirit. 
I didn't even get into some of those passages. Okay, because it's the Spirit that led Jesus during the temptation time. He led him out that direction. And that's kind of interesting, because now, you know, before it's like, well, the Father's the supreme authority. This is in the eternal view, the eternal subordination view. The Father's the supreme authority, then the Son, and the Holy Spirit is under those two. But yet, while the Son's on the earth, there are times when the Son's obeying the Holy Spirit. So that kind of messes up, I shouldn't say messes up, but it challenges uh, the, etor the eternal subordinationist view. Um, so yeah, I, I, hopefully that answered your question you know, to some degree. Now I know, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Any more questions, comments, Eric? Yeah, uh, uh, why, you, you mentioned something in regards to, you felt that if you have the sender and then Sender plus the scent, and then you have the scent. That somehow there's a diminishing, or maybe not a, a share of equality uh, in regards to of their essence. But why even make that distinction? Why not? Can't we just say? I guess here's my question: How is just because one functions different a diminishing of of an equality? So, in other words, having an eternal submission could be simply a function and not necessarily diminishing of uh, essence. That would, okay, so the question is, is, is um, why is it that a function that one person would have in the Trinity from eternity, so always having this function, why would that diminish the very nature of that person as a member of the Trinity? In some sense, that's what's the question. I thought I might repeat yes. it. I don't know how the mic speaks some of that stuff. So, um, here's, here's the thing. Um, matter of fact, that, that's one of the arguments from the eternal subordinationist side, you see, is they say there's no problem here. This is not an issue of nature. This is an issue of function and relationship. However, it seems that, and I, hopefully you can kind of follow me along on this, that which, what, whatever, because eternality, is part of the nature of God. He is eternal by nature. Okay. Whatever a quality one person has, if it's an eternal quality, I don't think you can escape the fact that it then boils down to being something about the person's nature. Now you could say, well, he just he just decided to do that from eternity. Well, if he did it of his own will, then you're more egalitarian. Because it's not because he's a son that he's subordinate, it's because of, of a will. But if it's a quality of the second person that he's subordinate, and that quality is an eternal quality, you seem to have crossed from the nature of being a person, or from, from the aspect, I want to I start using that word nature confusingly, you seem to pass from the aspect of being a person into the aspect of the nature of the person. Because now it's an eternal quality. Does that make sense? Right. And then it seemed like it's being called a quality. It's a function. So you want to equate, to play it, Dennis, that is. Please. Uh, you want to equate a, a function performed in eternity as a quality? Because of the nature of eternity. That's why. As soon as we make something eternal, okay, and because eternality is part of the nature of God, not necessarily an aspect of the person of God. See, what makes a person eternal is not the, is not the aspect of being a person. It's, that, it's the aspect of the nature of God that makes that person eternal. It's because God is by nature eternal that therefore the person is eternal. Now, one of the problems in studying the Trinity, um, and I shouldn't say problem as in like difficulty, but is, is a starting point. And the starting point is that, are you going to try to explain how three persons are one God? Or are you going to try to try to explain, you're going to attempt to try to explain how one God is three persons? And you see the starting point then somewhat changes the dynamic of the language in which you try to get these two to coalesce. You start from persons and, and, the na and, and how someone is a person, personal, but yet how they are one God. Or you start with one God. But how a one God can be three in person. 
And the approaches are sometimes difficult. But the crossover is between function and relationship and nature, which is the very thing that you were, you know, you were addressing. I think as soon as you make a function eternal, you, you've now brought the realm of that function into the nature aspect of who God is. You've taken a function and you've brought it into the scope, or so to speak, or the aspect of eternality. And eternality is part of the nature of God, and I think you can't escape it in that way. That's why we're not, we don't, we're not afraid to say that, you know, someone were asked, well, what are the things that the Trinity has been doing since eternity? Loving itself. Well, why is that? Because love is part of the nature of God. So there's no problem saying that God's been functioning in an eternal sense in love because love is part of the very nature of God. But this authority submission thing seems to not fit in an eternal sense as well. It seems to be, I think, more of a temporal aspect. But please continue. Because, because uh, by definition, uh, function... Uh, uh, a, 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 a function maintained eternally um, would be unchanging. It would be. So, so it'd have to be. Uh, and that's and now and like you said, so eternality, unchanging, uh, those are synonyms in some sense, right? That God is unchanging. Um, if He wasn't eternal, He would be a changing God, because there would be a time in which He wasn't, and then a time in which He was, and a change occurred. So, right, you're you're absolutely right. Part of et eternality is the implication of unchanging. And so you're right. If, if, if that function um, is unchanging, then it's part of part of eternity. So, any other questions? Yeah, uh, I noticed that uh, you did maybe it's time constraint. You didn't address the use of the terms. You almost went there when you said, as it relates to the Father, because you can't find the term Father in the Old Testament. Doesn't exist. Yeah, except the Isaiah passage. Except, well, but that's referring to Christ. Right, right. But I mean, the character we're calling the Father. <laughs> the, the first person, the first the first one we would normally refer to as the first person. It's never referred to as the Father. It seems difficult. difficult. Yeah, correct. It's called God, but I mean, don't, don't, yeah. don't confuse that with him being called the Father of Israel. That's a, oh, yeah. That's yeah. a different issue. Right, that's totally different. So I, I'm saying within the Trinity, we don't get that. You know, we get God, we get, uh, you know, like you said, Yahweh, Elohim, for the most part, early on. And we, ha we can have to identify which function of Elohim, mm -hmm. you know, is actually carrying it out. So we have to go to the commentary, which is our New Testament, to sometimes explain to us, like in the passages you mentioned, the Colossian passage and the John passage, which says that it was Christ who created all things, right. which was the God of Genesis 1-1. I guess my point is that since we don't have this father aspect in the Old Testament, you didn't address at all the language of accommodation that we grew up early learning. Was there a reason behind that? Because it seems like father and son are both just language for our benefit and it has nothing to do with Godhead. It's, it's them communicating to us so we can comprehend something about the Godhead and its function or maybe even his structure. But nevertheless, it's just language. God is a spirit, Jesus says. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit. Mm -hmm. So now, if God is a spirit, does he, as one guy says, he's got children? You know, <laughs> well, does he have <laughs> you spirit see children? So that, 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 that title, son, you know, where does that originate from? You know, mm -hmm. what is that about? It's right. And, and, well, thank you for making that point. You're right. That, um, that God communicating things to us about his very nature is in some sense a language of accommodation, which means that, um, and this is in no slight to us at all, but it's because of the very nature of who God is, that he must condescend to us. He must, in some sense, reduce his thoughts to a human level for us to understand what it is that he wants us to understand, so that to some capacity we can even begin to understand it. And without that condescension, which we could use the term language of accommodation, it's accommodating us. Yes. Without that language of accommodation, I mean, it'd be almost like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if God spoke to us on his level, well, I mean, we just wouldn't get it. Yeah, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. Yeah, 
Now, uh, I know I'm running short on time. Um, if there aren't any other questions, any other questions, comments? Yes. Hey, I got one more. I got a question. You, you, you know, maybe you, you touched on this uh, a little bit, but maybe you just kind of amplify it. You didn't. You talked about that this distinction. You know, you know, a little bit of language of accommodation, but at the same time, how does one make that distinction in eternity past? How do we make that distinction? Do we? You know, what was? You were kind of going there, and you didn't really get into it. So, right. if we take your temporal um, submission view, what do we have then? Do we do we have a triune God or not? We have a triune God, but we don't have much. Okay. okay, that's why the eternal subordinationist view is so popular because it gives so much more of a concrete answer as to the relationship between. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity. The problem is, is, I don't think that relationship that we see in scriptures bears out eternity according to the scriptures. Now, like I said in the beginning, we're finite, we're limited, and all we have are the scriptures. If God hasn't revealed much about the nature of how the Trinity related in eternity, you know, and some people, some people ask, well, what was God doing before eternity? Um, you know, then, you know, then that's, uh, you know, then, then, then we don't have it. If we don't have it, we can't make very many bold claims. We can speculate. We can try to uh, we can try to surmise based on the passages that we have. Um, we can we can do that from the attributes of God that, that He has revealed about Himself to us. That God acts within those attributes to uh, to commune within Himself. Certainly, God doesn't need anything. So, uh, so the relationship is a very satisfying, content relationship that they have. And I believe one of the primary reasons why creation came into existence in the first place is because God wanted to share that very beauty of his very nature with, with other creatures for their enjoyment. He, he wanted to extend the beauty of the communal relationship in the Trinity. He wanted to extend that to creatures. Now, they would never experience it to the, to, to the extent that the Trinity experiences it within itself, but he wanted them to be able to enjoy that. And, uh, and that's why. Not, God doesn't create because he needs anything. If you have a God that needs something, then he's an imperfect God. Um, so anyways, I don't know if that kind of answered your question. I didn't, I didn't. What I basically right. told you is I don't have much of an answer. Okay. Um, that's why the egalitarian side sometimes is viewed as lacking. But uh, I'm just going to say, and I don't mean to sound arrogant, okay? Because I'm not trying to pick on the other side, but I'm just going to say I will only tread where the scriptures allow me to tread. Right. Now, they feel they've done the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to say that they say, well, we don't we tread beyond the scriptures. Because who, what Christian in humility in their right mind would make such a claim? None. But I'm just telling you that I've taken this side, and I'm only willing to tread where the scriptures allow me to tread. Yeah. There is a passage, uh, as it relates to the temporal subordination position, uh, that would, you could argue that... Okay, this passage says whatever existed in eternity past was different than what existed in time or after the incarnation. Because Jesus in his prayer prior to the crucifixion, if you recall, when he was praying to the Father, he says, Now restore me to the glory which I had with you right. before the foundation of the world. So something existed in eternity past that didn't exist in time. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't include that passage, but that's a great passage. Yeah, um, I came across that passage, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, I'm surprised I didn't get the question. Uh, I don't know how much more time we have, or how much we want to want to play with this topic. I'm surprised I didn't get the question <laughs> that that there's no egalitarian relationship in marriage, and that marriage, being the very mirror of the relationship of the Trinity, to take an egalitarian view of the Trinity is to destroy the authority. Uh, the authority structure in marriage. I'm surprised I didn't get that rebuttal. Or something. But where, if I heard you correctly, where do you get the idea that marriage is a picture of the Trinity? That passage um, is in Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken. Um, God is the head of the man. Man is the head of the woman. Um, let me see if I can find the passage real quick. Yes. Uh, the glory of God is man, and the glory of man is God. Yeah, I think yeah. Yes. Um, let's see. 
That's simply an authority issue. Yeah, the authority authority is the divinity. There's the Holy Spirit involved there. Well, I would say that the, the, the eternal subordinationist view does appeal to marriage, although I don't think it's a very good one. Um, you have first. Let's go to First Corinthians eleven three real quick, which is I think the one that I was alluding to. Let me make sure. Yeah, the Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Um, so there seems to be an established rela authority relationship here. Uh, the man is the head of the woman, just as uh, Christ is the head of man, just as God is the head of Christ. Um, my rebuttal to something like that would be one. Um, Christ could be in reference to the Son and His temporal function, number one. And number two, as we were joking about last night, I believe, that, um, that marriage is actually something temporal. There is no marriage in heaven. It doesn't extend into that eternal relationship, you see. So, um, so to say that it represents an eternal aspect of God would, in its implication, mean that marriage carried on is some kind of eternal thing. Matter of fact, even our salvation, as far as how we are viewed equally in Christ, there's neither male nor female. You see, there's there's no there's no hierarchy in that regard. So that would be my rebuttal. But that's that's actually one of the issues that um, that they bring up. Yeah, so, yeah, that would definitely be more of a temporal yeah. right argument. Um, what, what I heard some. What verse are you citing from? Uh, when, when I, when I said it's eleven three. Eleven three. Yeah. 11, three. Now, since this is, uh, if you don't mind me taking about uh, five or ten more minutes of your time, since this has also been called an apologetics conference, I thought I would just tease you with a little bit of something. Um, how the Trinity actually acts as an apologetic. There is a, a, an argument, and I'm not well versed enough from it for you, so you have to excuse me for a minute as I somewhat read from my notes. Okay, But there's an argument that proposes that an omniscient, omnipresent being um, cannot know anything. Okay? And it goes in something like that. In order to be self-aware, apply concepts and form judgments. By the way, I have a problem with that already. Mm -hmm. Forming judgments. Yeah. Um, if God goes through rational processes to arrive at something, he didn't know that thing before getting there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> being an omniscient being, he doesn't have what we call discursive thinking right. or rational thought processes in order to arrive to a knowledge. But So that's the first hole in the argument. But it goes something like this. Uh, in order to be self-aware, apply concepts and forward judgments, and therefore to have a mind, there must be objects that are external to a being that it can become aware of and grasp in relationship to itself. And if there's not something external to it, then it can have a mind that's able to judge between itself and something different. And that's what the mind does. The mind differentiates. Not only that, a mind knows itself versus something different. It knows the subject versus the object. And if a God who's omnipresent, who is in all things and knows all things, then that God would not be able to have a mind such that it could dis distinguish between itself over there and itself over here, because it's the same self. And to have that kind of ultimate knowledge, to know something perfectly as it is, um, it's really not to be able to make a distinction between knowledge and knowledge. Well, besides my little jab already at the problem with, with knowledge, it's very interesting that this argument works only against a monotheistic type of religion. If God is only one person, then God doesn't know the difference between himself and himself. But in the actual trinity itself, there's a subject-object distinction. And how is that? Well, because the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, yet they're one God. So this argument that was brought about about the 18th century, to try to say it's impossible to have this kind of God. Either, either you have a God who's not omnipresent and omniscient, or... You, or you have no God at all, is refuted by the very nature of the Trinity itself. You don't even have to go beyond the Trinity. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it, it, there might be another uh, a, a re refutation of that theory. Uh, imagine a Helen Keller without her family, okay, 
even though she did not have the visual and the audible perceptions, she still could relate to her family because they were there. Touchy. Mm -hmm. uh, what if the family wasn't there? What if she was just in a room with four walls? Would, would, this, would this refutation break down because she could touch the wall and relate to herself? Well, and imagine her in the middle of space, or a, where there's nothing there, supposing that her life faculties could be sustained in the middle of space. Well, make it more realistic. Such that, that she can't touch it. Possible, right? Well, I'm, but we... I, I'm, I'm just saying, that's what, what I would we're argue. Trying to do. No, it's be more realistic if okay. you're going to use that argument. That's what I would argue back at you. Right, right. So, I, you know, you got to put her someplace, because she's a physical being. So she... So then... Maybe this would break down because she can touch herself, she yeah. can touch the walls. Yeah. Well, so to touch herself wouldn't be a problem because it's just subjective awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's no distinction between the self and the self. But to touch a wall now suddenly makes a distinction between the subject and the object. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now there's the realization of an object. So everything that's going on in the mind now extends beyond the self and the experience of the self to an experience of an external word world or something external to the So self. that example wouldn't be a good reputation. It, it does kind of break down. That's why I said if you put, you know, if you put the person, let's say, you know, someplace where they're suspended, yeah. such that, they, that all the senses are shut down, you know. Yeah, there would still be self-awareness. There would be self-awareness, yeah. right. The interesting thing with the, the, the Trinity is that they commune with one another. Right. And there's a distinction between the persons. So that they're in the, and you see these topics, you know, uh, amongst the atheists and all this kind of stuff, they throw these topics stuff all around. The subject-object distinction, the unity versus plurality, how do we resolve these things because God is a unity, but he's also plural in some sense. Mm -hmm. You know, although we don't make the mistake of saying that God, there's one God and three gods, that would be a contradiction. If we said there's one and only one God, and then we said there are three gods, that would be a contradiction. Um, but what we see from scripture is that God is one in nature or essence, as far as all his attributes, but he's three in persons. And so anyways, um, I just thought I'd throw it out there if I had a couple of extra time. So. Anything else? Everybody's willing to live with my conclusion. Yeah. I just want to make an announcement before everyone heads out. Tonight, we're going to take a, a, the dinner break. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, we're going to be upstairs in uh, the chapel. Is it called the chapel? Where, uh, I think it's the FLC. The FLC. What does FLC stand for? Family Life Center. Family Life Center. Upstairs, 7 o'clock, Family Life Center. So you definitely want to take every, all your belongings to the center. Basketball court. And, uh, but then tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock a.m. sharp, we'll be back down here. So during the day sessions we're down here, the evening sessions will be upstairs in the Family Life. And that's simply as you walk through the doors, it'll be to your left-hand side. It'll be, you, still, you see the stairs, just keep going back. And you'll run right into the Family Life Center. And tonight, Ron Wallace will be teaching on the pre-rapture position. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a really, uh, really uh, good time tonight as we get into the, uh, to the rapture. I don't know if he's going to mention Harold Campbell. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be really good. If you're not familiar with the pre-rapture, rapture, so, uh, and now we're going to get a dinner break. And I'll talk about where we eat, where we go.